We know that there are ways to give these good guys, like Ackermansia, uh, what they like to eat. And they love resistant starches. They love tubers, like yams, like jicama, like taro root, like yuca or yucca. They love uh, mushrooms. And there's a beautiful recent study out of uh, South Asia of people basically having a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's if you eat two cups of mushrooms a week. What? So there is this incredible compound in mushrooms. Uh, I'll probably fracture it. Ergothionine, thionine, that actually crosses the blood-brain barrier hmm. better than turmeric curcumin right. and actually protects uh, against neuroinflammation. Hmm. And it turns out that mushrooms absolutely positively feed these friendly bacteria. And mushrooms contain this compound called spermidine. Mm -hmm. It's a polyamine that study after study shows promotes longevity. Okay, so those are some of the things. Also, inulin-containing compounds. Mm -hmm. So inulin is present in chicory. Uh, you can buy inulin made out of yacon root in many store as a sweetener. So inulin feeds Ackermansia. And so it's present in chicory, it's present in radicchio, Belgian endive, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, sunchokes. They're just pure inulin. Hmm. So the more of this stuff you eat, uh, the more of this bug you're going to grow. So that's number one. So eat for them. Number two. Exercise. Beautiful study in women. Women have more Alzheimer's disease than men. And so you look at an exercise program in women. Women who exercise regularly, routinely, kind of from midlife on, have a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's. Whoa. And compared to women who don't exercise routine. Mm. And in the women who are going to get Alzheimer's, it's 11 years later than if they didn't exercise. So, I mean, think about that. If we had a drug that had a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's, yeah. you know, how much would we pay for that? You know, nuts. you and I would be <laughs> popping that nuts. every day. Uh, we wouldn't have $40 billion wasted on amyloid drugs. Mm. But it's available by housework, by gardening by getting a dog and walking it twice a okay, day. Okay, that's interesting. So when you say housework, why do you say that? I think people would be confused by that. It turns out that, uh, give me an example, my, my mother actually scrubbed her floors until the day she died at 90, uh, even though there were Swifters and things mm. like that. And she did it as an exercise program. Exercise changes the gut microbiome yeah, that's to a friendly microbiome. Meditation, yoga changes the gut microbiome. It seems impossible. It's so interesting that they're in a two-way communication. Yeah, yeah. It literally, and there's there's even some really cool stuff that yoga postures uh, actually move this microbiome mm. around in your gut, and they actually get signals, probably electrical signals. So all these chakras that, you know, in Eastern medicine, it's probably all this part of this really amazing communication system that Western medicine is just going, oh, come on, that's all voodoo. Yeah. Because Seems we couldn't impossible. measure it before. Mm. Yeah. So exercise is really important. Lastly, uh, I really want people to have a brainwash day mm. at least once a week. So in the last couple of years, we've learned that there is a lymph system in the brain called the glymphatic system. And it, no one actually believed it existed, but now it, it exists. And the brain actually, in deep sleep, which happens very early in the sleep cycle, goes through a literal wash cycle. Mm -hmm. It shrinks by about 20%. And all of these toxins, like amyloid, like tau, like bad pieces of protein are actually squeezed out of the brain, like wringing out mm. a sponge. And it happens in deep sleep and it happens early in the sleep cycle. So we have to have a lot of blood flow to our brain to do that. The brain uses huge amounts of blood flow, but we have to have even more. 
So the evidence is that you need about a three or four hour window before the last meal of your day, before you go to sleep. Why? Because digestion is actually really energy expensive. So we put huge amounts of blood flow down into our gut. If you eat near the time you go to bed, that blood flow is down in your intestines and it doesn't go up to your brain. Mm. So there's actually a recent study of men who had uh, unstable angina or heart attack. And they followed those men who ate late at night had a much higher incidence of a new wow. angina or new heart, heart attack. Hmm. And so they're all really actually interconnected. So one day a week, I ask people, finish your last meal at six o'clock. Hmm. If you go to bed at say 10. Right. If it's 11, finish it at seven. Do not snack before bedtime. And allow yourself to have a brainwash. Better yet, skip a meal. And that gets in probably to the fourth point. You've got to have periods of extended lengths of time between eating. We were supposed to go prolonged periods of time before our next meal. Mm. And break fast, we've talked about this before, it ruins your, you know, your morning stuff, uh, was you break your fast. And, it, and there's no definition of when you know, it's supposed to be breakfast. Mm. That was from the dear old Kellogg's Corn Flake Company telling people they had to eat breakfast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that the whole um, lifestyle that you just painted like makes all the sense in the world. Like when you start looking at the research, even just like, so one, I can certainly speak to the anti-inflammatory properties of a lot of things that you're talking about, um, which that has been revolutionary in my life. Intermittent fasting has had a whole host of benefits for me anecdotally, and then certainly I think there's a lot of data backing things up. You've talked a lot about how eating is just an excuse to get olive oil in your mouth. Man, I hope you're right about that one because I have really um, taken that to heart. And there does seem to be some pretty tremendous benefits to that. Um, it's, it's really pretty extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it really is. Um, you know, and I, I show a lot of studies. I think the, probably the best one is the Predimed study out of Spain where just simplistically, they took 65-year-old people, divided them into three groups. One, they all ate a Mediterranean diet, Spain. Yeah. Uh, one group had to use a liter of olive oil per week. The second group had to eat the equivalent calories in walnuts primarily. The third group had a low-fat Mediterranean diet, followed for five years. The in initial study was look at memory. The olive oil group and the walnut group had improved memory after wow. five years. The low-fat group lost memory. The people in all groups with known coronary artery disease or stroke, the olive oil group had a 30% reduction in new events. The uh, low-fat group had an increase, uh, continued mm. events. So this stuff is miraculous. Um, it actually grows neurons, the polyphenols in olive oil. And here's another crazy fun fact. Now there's a, a chemical that I talk about called TMAO, discovered by the Cleveland Clinic. TMAO is made by our gut bacteria, mm. primarily from animal proteins, particularly choline and carnitine. Choline's in egg yolks. We need choline for our brain, but our gut bacteria love it. They make it out of these, and TMAO damages blood vessels. To the Cleveland Clinic's credit, they said, well, wait a minute, uh, the Mediterranean diet seems to be very good for preventing heart disease, and yet these guys eat fish, they, you know, they eat cheeses, they eat salamis, well, what gives? So they actually discovered that there are polyphenols in certain olive oils, balsamic vinegar, and red wine that paralyze these enzyme systems in the bacteria. It doesn't mm. kill the bacteria, it paralyzes the enzymes. So you could eat all the choline and carnitine you want, but you will not make TMAO. Mm. So olive oil, balsamic vinegar, make a spritzer of balsamic vinegar and sparkling water. Yeah, you got me on that. Yeah, and have a glass of red wine. And so you will, prov you'll, you can still have your, you know, your meat and eat it too, but I like not that. much. I like that. All right, tell people where they can find your book. Uh, 
anywhere, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, Audible. I actually did the Audible of this book. Uh, so if you want to hear my voice longer and longer, I, I read the book. Why not? Uh, you can find it at Gundry MD. You can find me at drgundry.com. Come to my YouTube channel. I've got a podcast, the Dr. Mm, Gundry Podcast. Yes. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Mm. What's the one change that people could make that would have the biggest impact on their longevity? The one change, and I, you know, I get on my soapbox, is you got to get your vitamin D level up. Take at least 5,000 IUs of vitamin D. Now, a day? A day. The University of California, wow. San Diego has shown that the average American to have an adequate vitamin D level should have 9,600 international units a day. The average American. Whoa. If you look at cancer patients, they almost always have a low vitamin D. Every one mm -hmm. of my patients with autoimmune disease walks through the door with a low vitamin D. If you look at, if you like the telomere theory of aging, mm -hmm. where the little caps on the end of chromosomes, and it's a good theory of aging, the higher your vitamin D level, the longer your telomeres are. Interesting. And vitamin D, getting back to those little crypts down in, the, down mm. in our shag carpet, those stem cells actually have to be stimulated to move by vitamin D. And if you don't have vitamin D, they will sit there and you will have a leaky gut. There it so is. So that's number one. Number it. two, take time to release vitamin C mm. twice a day or chew a 500 milligram vitamin C four times a day. All right. We're one of the few animals that don't produce vitamin C, mm. and you got to have it for so many functions, particularly if women, they have to know that collagen will not repair all their wrinkles without vitamin C. Mm. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Make sure to check out the next one here. And if we're trying to live a long time, we absolutely want to limit the process of generating harmful compounds, generating turning on mTOR, 